Finally, spring is in the air, and the smell of fresh potting mix is a welcome recharge for us backyard growers. Even though there is a lot for us to do right now, it's still got to be one of the most exciting times of the year to be a gardener. It's both exciting and busy because there's no doubt the days are getting warmer. Although, we're constantly reminded that we're not quite out of the woods yet. But at least we're starting to grow again. And at least we've had all these garden quickies to tide us over in the meantime. So, in case you missed it, here's Volume 19, Episodes 181 to 190. Enjoy. Herbs are a crop group that punch far above their weight class. And one amazing example is this guy right here. Rosemary, a once Mediterranean native now grown worldwide, is a pungently prolific plant that's actually a member of the mint family. Vigorous to the point of being noxious. It grows in a variety of conditions, but does it grow year round? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're always growing year round. And today's episode is all about that rosemary. More specifically, is this plant a perennial or is it an annual? Time short as it always is, so let's dive in and find out. Let's get this out of the way first by stating unequivocally that in its native habitat, Grown in the climate that it's evolved to thrive in, rosemary is indeed a perennial. That is, rosemary bushes grow all year long, all 12 months through every season. Not only that, no matter what the weather is doing, no matter how cold it gets, rosemary never sheds its leaves and it never goes dormant. Which is precisely why sometimes they're also an annual. In colder climates, say zone 7 or lower, rosemary tends to adopt a year-long life cycle. Not that these guys want to become an annual, more because they're simply dying from it being too cold. It's not a true annual in the sense that it's flowered, fruited, gone to seed, and completed its entire life cycle. In actuality, the climate is simply dictating that these guys can no longer survive below a certain threshold. So, if you're trying to figure out how to grow rosemary and what you're in for in terms of longevity and life cycle, well, it all depends on where you live. And while you're trying to figure that out, make sure to check out the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Plants, especially the ones we grow for food, are awesome. As gardeners, that's not something we really need convincing of. From life cycles that burn brightly, giving up all the goods in a single season, to others that keep going year after year, albeit with a few breaks in between. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, there's nothing wrong with taking a little break. And today's episode is all about those breaks. More specifically, plant dormancy. Why do they do it? What's the point? Time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. If the conditions are just right, many plants will go about their business for years and years without a care in the world. We call these plants perennials. Trees are the most perfect example of this. Evergreen stalwarts grown in situ for decades. But even within that great group of plants, there lie specimens that go dormant. Like this cherry tree here. And that's because not all plants can weather the winter in an actively growing state. To combat the cold, they gotta go dormant. If certain plants, like this blueberry bush here, were to remain actively growing when the real cold hits, water, in the stems and leaves would freeze and rupture their cells. Kind of like our irrigation lines. In short, dormancy is a survival mechanism for our plants. 
the certain plants that want to or have to grow longer than a single season to complete their life cycle, but cannot survive the winter in an actively growing state. Basically, it's a hibernation for plants, and it's triggered by a drop in temperatures coupled with less hours of less light intensity. A well-deserved break for our crops that are going to be sprouting back to life this spring. Like this strawberry plant here. Hey, quite likely we'll be taking a break too, but just for the holidays. Don't worry, we'll be back well before spring starts. In gardening, some years we have to take the good with the bad. With the goal being to limit the bad as much as possible. And each year, as our knowledge base grows, we get better and better at this. That's because we learn far more from our mistakes than we do our successes. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're all about that learning. And today's episode is all about those gardening mistakes. More specifically, five common mistakes to avoid that you may have made in the past. Hey, time short as it always is, so let's dive in. Getting a tiny seed to eventually grow into a monster veggie producing machine is nothing short of amazing. Yet, it's something that we do every year. And every year we get better and better at doing it because we limit the repeating of mistakes. The first of those, not starting our seeds too early. With the holidays in the past, for people like us, the gardening bug hits hard, but we can't get ahead of ourselves. Lanky, weak, overgrown seedlings are not going to help us this spring. So hold back your plantings until at least four to six weeks before your last spring frost. But just like too early, we can also start our seeds too late. Yes, you can just buy your seedlings and starts from the store, but if your plan is to create your own, you need to observe those defined planting windows to give yourself the best chance of success. Another pitfall to avoid was picking the wrong plants to grow. It's a great rule to only grow what you love to eat, I agree. But not everything that you love to eat is suitable to grow in your area. Yes, we want to grow our favorites, but we also have to keep in mind what plants are going to thrive in our region. Be smarter with our choices and avoid those past mistakes. When that day finally comes for planting, we need to be more mindful of that spacing. Early on, the plants are quite small and the gaps in between them appear to be very large and very tempting. But with the days getting warmer and longer, your garden is going to grow very quickly at this time of the year. And without adequate spacing, your crops will simply suffer. Don't make this mistake again and observe the spacing rules for each variety right from the beginning. And lastly, the fifth mistake that we're going to avoid in our garden this year is bad watering habits. That means no watering from above, no watering in the evening, and eliminate those shallow frequent waterings. Let's train those plant roots to go down and deep right from the start so that we can weather anything that this summer throws at us. Solve these past mistakes and watch your garden explode with production this year. And while you're at it, make sure to check out new episodes of The Garden Quickie. In gardening, we're often quick to point out all the mistakes we've made. But sometimes we deserve some credit as well. It's true that we learn more from our missteps than we do our successes, but it's never a bad idea to reflect on when things go positive in the garden so that we can repeat them each season. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we'll take any success that we can get. And today's episode is all about those successes. More specifically, five things we did last year to give us a better garden. Let's consolidate their benefits and apply them to this year. Hey, 
Time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. In gardening, if something's really working for you, don't break it by trying to fix it. And the first thing we don't want to change is good timing. Sure, every crop and every climate is different, but as a good rule, we don't want to be starting our seeds any earlier than about a month before our last spring frost date. If you've got a groove going with a timeline that works for you and your favorite crops, don't change it now for no reason. Keep doing what works. And at number two, when we did finally plant, we did it at the right depth. Very deep for tomatoes and peppers, and at the existing root color for most other crops. Roots go below ground and shoots above. Seems obvious, but even just a fraction of an inch of incorrect depth can yield you some pretty poor results. The other success we had was with our spacing. Whether it's seeds or starts, plants begin their life pretty small, and the gaps between them are quite large and ominous. We did good by resisting the temptation to simply jam everything together as we observed the spacing rules right from the start. We also planned out and picked the best spots for each of our crops. Full sun for those that needed it, and partial shade for those that can take it. Not all locations work for all crops, and being thoughtful of where we plant gave us the best results. And finally, the fifth thing that we did well last year, and that we're gonna continue to do diligently every year, is mulching. Straw, leaves, grass clippings, and even seaweed. We used it all, and made sure that our topsoil layers were covered and protected. No erosion, very little weeds, limited exposure, and far less temperature extremes means that we had better crops for less maintenance in the day-to-day. -day. Which gives us more time to check out new episodes of the Garden Quickie. Yes, for some of us, it may still be quite cold outside, but like the unstoppable force that it is every year, the new gardening season is definitely on the horizon. And even though it feels really early, the time to once again start some of our seedlings is right now. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're always ready for a new season. And today's episode is all about that seed starting. More specifically, five crops that are best started early indoors to get a jump on the season. Hey, time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. When retail decides it's spring, it's not subtle. Endless racks and rows of vegetable seeds tempting us with every variety imaginable. But, not all crops are suited to be started early. Poor transplanters, mass seeders, and quick crops are best planted directly instead of grown early indoors. One such crop though is known as the king of head start plants, and that's tomatoes. With what seems like a million different varieties to choose from, tomatoes are the world's most popular backyard crop but it's not because people like them above all other vegetables. Instead, their popularity is attributed to the fact that they grow predictably, ship easily, and transplant readily. There's no doubt that industry has decided the tomato plant's popularity. But if you love this crop, it's one of the first ones you've got to start early. Nearly as popular, we have tomato's little cousin, peppers. Also a great transplanter, peppers do take a little bit longer to get going, but once they do, it's game on. The trick is to give those freshly planted seeds just a little bit more heat, otherwise they take forever to get going. Coming in at number three, we've got cucumbers. Now, I admit, these guys aren't the greatest transplanters, but there's still a two month plus crop that needs the entire summer window to grow. 
So, they're on the list. They're not too bad. Don't let them get overgrown, and just be gentle with the root systems when you're moving them on, and they shouldn't give you too much trouble. This next one can be planted and grown a few different ways, but honestly, the best way to do these guys is to make your own starters. I'm talking onions. Also grown from either direct seeding or by mini onions called sets, by far the superior way to ensure bulbing up of your onions are well-timed seedlings that you start yourself. Ensure that you have the right variety in either long day or short day for your area and you'll be good to go. And lastly, our final choice for plants that you should start early indoors is actually a group of plants. We're talking herbs. Start these guys early and often for a continual harvest nearly year round. Most transplant extremely well and they can also be grown in containers and even indoors. Herbs are a no brainer and they're a great choice for beginners who are just getting their hands dirty. There's nothing like a good head start to the new growing season to ensure this year's success. Just make sure to have fun and check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. All winter long, our garlic cloves have given off the impression of doing nothing and being completely dormant. When in reality, we know that they've been busy. Planted as unassuming dormant cloves in the fall, garlic actually sends out an extensive root system immediately after it hits moisture. Garlic is always doing something for us. And now that spring is right on our doorstep, it's time to return the favor. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie. The show we're in two minutes or less, garlic is our game. And today's episode is all about that garlic. More specifically, three things we need to do to get the best garlic bulbs later on this summer. Hey, time is short as you know it is, so let's dive in. Although this surprises a lot of people, your hard neck garlic will often break dormancy during or even before winter. No issues there, but so too will the weeds. Garlic is an undemanding crop, but what things it does need are non-negotiable. Space to properly bulb up is necessary to get the most out of this crop. Make sure to weed your garlic beds in the spring carefully, thoroughly, and diligently. This one tip makes an immediate difference on the trajectory of your garlic's growth. Next, just as we've messed up our nice neat beds of garlic, we need to reapply and fix any of that displaced mulch. Heavy rains are the spring norm, at least where I live, and exposed soils run the risk of simply washing away. A nice thick mulch layer is going to protect the topsoil from unnecessary erosion while also locking in valuable moisture once that summer heat finally comes. And finally, early spring is when our garlic gets a boost. That's right, I'm talking fertilizing. Garlic is only fed twice during its entire life cycle and the first one of the year is the most important of the two. Go organic, low dose, balanced, but possibly skewing slightly higher in nitrogen, and you'll put your garlic in an upwards trajectory to greatness. Three easy, but chronologically important things to get your garlic growing right this spring. Know what else is chronologically important? Checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. One of last year's biggest producers is getting ready to repeat his rewards for the new growing season. That's right, strawberries, one of the earliest crops to break its winter dormancy. Tough, 
resilient, low maintenance but prolific, there's not much we have to do with our strawberries, but what we do do, we do right now. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we actually do a lot with what little time we have. And today's episode is all about those strawberries. More specifically, three spring tasks to get the most out of your patch this year. Hey, time short as it always is, so let's dive in. Hey, these spring strawberry tips are designed for those of you with existing patches, at least from the last year. If you're just getting your patch together for the coming season, check out this guide here for everything you need to know about planting strawberries. Like we said, strawberry plants are built for the frigid weather. They're a cool climate powerhouse that needs a dormant period to reset itself every year. As such, if you're growing strawberries, you likely live in an area that gets a true winter. Now, for those of you with extreme and severe winters, you most likely buried your strawberry plants under a thick layer of mulch. So, the first thing we need to do is to remove all of that winter mulch that's covering our strawberry plants. This can be done before your last spring frost date, but if you're still hitting those extreme negatives, hold off until the weather is a little bit warmer. At or just below freezing is ideal. With that mulch layer removed, you're now at the same point as the rest of us. Continuing with that cleanup, old foliage can also be cut down and removed at this time. The goal of this step is to make sure that our strawberry crowns are still exposed. They can easily get buried over winter and a smothered strawberry plant will never be successful. Next up is weeding because strawberries absolutely hate competition. Right now is literally the easiest time to weed our strawberry beds and containers with minimal disturbance. And once all those weeds are gone, we can reapply another layer of mulch, taking care not to bury the crowns. And lastly, for our third and final spring strawberry tip, right now is a great time to give the plants a boost. That's right, I'm talking fertilizing, but only certain kinds of strawberries actually get fed in the spring. June bearing types need not apply here as they should have been fertilized in the late summer, early fall after their last harvest. This means that only your ever bearing and day neutral types of strawberries get fed in the early spring. Go balanced if you can, or skew slightly higher in phosphorus and potassium, which are the last two numbers on the fertilizer label. There you go. Three easy things that you can do in the spring for your strawberries that are gonna have a big effect later on. Know what else is gonna have a big effect later on? Checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. In the world of gardening, seed starting is serious business. What to grow, when to grow, and how to grow are dominating our thoughts as we're on the doorstep of another new season. Yet, with seed prices skyrocketing to stratospheric levels, the anxiety of getting the most sprouting success for your buck is priority number one. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, our priority number one is helping you to become a better gardener. And today's episode is all about seed starting. Specifically, three tips for maximizing your germination success this spring. Hey, time's in short supply as you know it is, so let's dive in. Seed starting is an annual event for a lot of us gardeners, but germination is only a small part of the process. For a whole seed starting and growing guide, check out this video right here. As I've said in the past, seeds are actually quite easy to sprout. Germination is simply a function 
of water and heat. A seed's coating absorbs water, swells, and then cracks, allowing the young plant to emerge. Heat controls the speed at which this happens, but we'll get to moisture and heat in a second, because as it is with all things gardening, it all starts with the soil. There's no question that a proper seeding soil is needed to get the best sprouting results. Excellent germination isn't just the sprouting of the seed, which can happen in just water. It's also the establishment of the little seedlings as a viable plant. A good seeding soil should be light, airy, free of impediments, drain well but retain moisture, and be at or near a neutral pH. Start with this, and half the battle will already be won. Back to that moisture. Seeds are going to sprout in any amount of water, even completely submerged. As they become seedlings, however, they're not going to survive without the presence of oxygen. Their roots need air, and if the soil is too wet, there isn't going to be enough of it. So, keep the soil moist, but never soggy and never saturated. And lastly, proper germination requires heat, likely more than the room you're growing them in. Grow lights and even direct sunlight sitting in a window can get pretty warm, but when in doubt, a proper heat mat is your best bet. 75 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit is the ideal soil temperature range for most of your summer favorites. Go slightly cooler for the brassicas, lettuces, and even onions. Three tips for the best sprouting success. Germination is only half the game, but without it, gardening would be very, very hard. You know what isn't very hard though? Checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. The engine that keeps our garden running takes a bit of a beating all winter long. Heavy rains, snow, freezing temperatures, erosion, compaction, frost heaving, you name it. Not really fair for something that does so much for our plants the rest of the year. So, with spring on the way, it's time to not just think about gardening and growing, but also about giving something back. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, all we do is give. And today's episode is all about our garden soils. More specifically, three boosters that we can give to recharge them after a long winter. Hey, time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. When feeding an organic, highly functional backyard garden, slow and steady wins the race. And adding in slow release dry amendments such as these to our soils and gardens directly is a great way to boost them in the late winter or early spring. Things such as alfalfa meal, canola meal, rock dust, rock phosphate, kelp sand, and even Epsom salts incorporated into already healthy soils can boost our production into the stratosphere. Being slow release, they can't burn your plants at any concentration. Just apply on the surface, even over that mulch, and let the rains wash them in. Our next booster is one that's completely free, and that's weeds. Now, this one does take a little bit of time, as we have to process this and make it ourselves. It's super simple, and all you need is a bucket, water, and time. What this lacks in complexity, though, it more than makes up for in effectiveness. Generally, weeds are colonizing plants that are more adept at gathering nutrients than your average crop is. As such, their foliage is often chock full of goodness that we can harvest in two easy steps. Gather a large amount of weeds like you normally would when you're cleaning your beds, but instead of throwing them on the compost pile, squish them in to a decent sized bucket. Fill that bucket right to the top with water, put on the lid, and let it sit for four to eight weeks. 
Once that solution is done fermenting the weeds, strain off the undigested stems and debris, and you're left with the best fertilizer that money can't buy. You can apply it at any strength, but I cut mine in half with regular tap water. Finally, if we subscribe to the idea of feeding our soils to feed our plants, then compost is the ultimate boost that we could ever give our gardens. Incorporated into our topsoils or simply top dressed into our beds, no amount of compost is too much. Adding not only nutrients, but also valuable microbial life, as well as organic matter, compost may just be the single best thing you do for your garden this year. Except maybe checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Summer is a time of plenty. Sweet bounties that we look forward to every year. In the case of our raspberries though, that doesn't happen without some diligent work in the early spring. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're nothing if not diligent. And today's episode is all about these raspberries. More specifically, three tasks that we need to do this spring to get the most out of our canes this summer. Hey, time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. No doubt just to mess with us, raspberries lead a dual life. What I mean is, your raspberry patch at any given time will have two or more different kinds of shoots, known as canes, growing on it. During the summer, you'll have the new shoots for the year, known as prima canes. Also, you'll have last year's prima canes that have turned into flora canes. They'll also likely be suckers, but let's focus on the prima canes and flora canes only. When it's early in the spring, this year's prima canes have not come up yet, and we're only left with the flora canes. However, there are still two different types of shoots in our raspberry patch. Let me explain. In raspberries, the flowers, and thus the fruit, really only appear on the second year shoots, the floricanes. And after they do, at the end of the season, those floricanes die. And by the time spring rolls around, we're left with just the two types of floricanes. Last year's dead ones, and this year's that's going to bear all the fruit. Which is why now, in the early spring, is the best time to prune your raspberry patch. As long as it's warm enough for the living shoots to have burst their buds, it's really easy to tell the two canes apart. Because one shoot is spent and dead, and the other one is growing and alive. Simply cut the dead ones down right at their base. It's quick work, and it shouldn't take you long. One other type of pruning that is optional is to trim the tops of the really tall canes. The shoots of raspberries tend to get really skinny and really floppy near the apex. Those clusters of fruit in the summer are gonna be heavy, and if your raspberries are too tall, you run the risk of bending the stems or even snapping them. The rule of thumb is to cut them down to about four to five feet, but again, this is optional. Winter tends to do a number on our soils. And our raspberry patches are no different, which is why right now in the early spring is the best time to build them back up. And the best way to do this is by adding two things, compost and mulch. Simply pile in and top dress your raspberry patch with some nice compost. Level it off nice and evenly so it's ready to accept the mulch. Just like everything else with our garden, we need to protect that topsoil. And the number one way to do that is to mulch. Here I'm using straw because it's what I have, but you can use grass clippings, leaves, or even yard trimmings. Use what you got as long as it's organic, clean, and chemical free. With the patch all pruned, cleaned, and retucked in, spring is the number one time 
to feed your raspberries. These guys can flower and fruit pretty quick. Not quite as early as strawberries, but still early enough that one, we don't want to be feeding too close to that fruiting stage, and two, we also don't want to use a nitrogen heavy fertilizer. Go balanced, skewing slightly higher in potassium if you can. That's the last of the three numbers on any fertilizer label. There you go. Three easy spring tips to get the most out of your raspberries this summer. Giving you all the more time to check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Thanks for watching, guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, make sure to subscribe and click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.